Hello and welcome to a Cook's Tour and our drinks pairing masterclass. This week we're trying two knockout English sparkling wines and to guide us through this tasting is Laura Rees, Master Sommelier from Gusbourne. Laura, thank you for joining us. Of course. It's thank lovely you. to see you. Lovely to see you. Um, and well, we're off to Paris this evening. Yes. Now, um, my concern is that our French friends might be up in arms that we're not trying a splendid French champagne, but instead we're trying something a little bit different and something very English. Yes. Yes, we are. We're tasting English sparkling wine. Mm -hmm. um, so yes, um, a real uh, homegrown treat, I think, and uh, an area of the wine world which is becoming more and more exciting. So well, that's it. Um, we were just chatting about this that we're sort of we're perhaps living through quite a sort of a special time yeah. for English wine and particularly English sparkling wine. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. And I think it's amazing if you see what has happened in the industry in the last 10, 15, 20 years. It's such a, a young industry, but very vibrant, very, um, uh, uh, very dynamic as well. So there's some really exciting producers, some wonderful wines being made and some excellent potential. Yeah, as well. it's good to be alive and good to yeah. be drinking English sparkling wine. And Gusbourne, you guys are at the very top of the game. So tell us a little bit about Gusbourne and... Well, yes. and, and, and then on to the wines, I guess. Okay, perfect. So, Gusbourne, uh, we are based in uh, in Kent. Mm. Uh, Gusbourne Estate is just outside uh, a village called Appledore, so about six miles inland from the coast, from Romney Marsh. Um, and uh, we have Chardonnay, Pinot Noir, Pinot Meunier planted uh, in Kent, and we have some land in Sussex as well. Uh, and uh, we're producing mostly traditional method sparkling wine that we have here, um, all single vintage, all from, from our own grapes, from, from the estate. Um, and I think we're going to taste the Brut Reserve and the Rosé this let's evening. Let's do that. OK, well, let's start with the Brut. Yeah, great. And they're such beautiful bottles. I tell Thank you, you. I mean, I, I, I know that it's all about the liquid inside, but actually, I mean, the, the, the branding, the label, everything about it is just, uh, it screams class. I love it. Thank you. So this is the Brut. This is the Brut. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so, uh, the Brut Reserve, it's vintage 2018. Okay. Um, and 2018 was quite a warm vintage, actually, for us in, in Kent and in Sussex. Um, and uh, has produced some really ripe, um, very um, uh, almost opulent fruit characters in the wine. But please do have a have a taste. It's um, uh, it's a blend of Chardonnay and Pinot Noir and Pinot Meunier. So the three classic varietals that we think of. Um, and uh, for us, the Brut Reserve is really about expressing a lot of that fruit character. Mm. So. Um, in the glass, there's there's lots of um, maybe white peach or nectarine, orange citrus, green apple, orchard fruit character, um, and that's really what we're we're looking to to achieve from. from Great. This well, I'm gonna give it a go. Hold on. Mm. Mm. Oh gosh, that's so delicious. Oh, I could I could guzzle that down. That's <laughs> so delicious. And Thank you're you. right. It's all that sort of <clears throat> freshness, fresh fruit. Um, orchard fruit. Yes. Delicious. I, I, I've been fortunate enough to go down to Gusbourne and so I can imagine um, the vineyard and um, the, I mean it's such a beautiful setting and uh, I mean you know oh, it's a taste of England. Thank you. Yeah really good. It, it is and it's wonderful to to walk through the vineyard and to see the, the vines and to really understand where the where the fruit comes from and I think you know we we stood together a couple of years ago at the top of Boot Hill and looked down towards uh, towards Romney Marsh and towards the English Channel really and there's nothing in between us and the coast and I think that proximity to the coast um, and, and the soils that we have really helped to define um, our grapes and the style of wine that we produce as well. So this is aged for um, just over three years okay. on the lees prior and what to does you. on the lees mean and how does that mm -hmm. help? I don't know, evolve the flavour. Yeah, so traditional method sparkling wine um, essentially means that a second fermentation happens within the bottle, which produces the fizz. And so um, a byproduct of that second fermentation is something that we call lees, which is essentially um, a, a, a byproduct of the yeast cells. 
and it's almost like a very fine sediment and aging a wine on the lees on the sediment really helps uh, to build more complexity more elegance and it's where you start to see a lot more of those toasty um, biscuity maybe nutty characters that you'd get from a traditional method sparkling wine or you might associate perhaps with a champagne versus um, a, a prosecco for example which is much more fruit driven so it's all about the lees aging and how that creates more depth and and weight and texture and intensity to the wine Great. as well. Fabulous. Well, that's utterly delicious. Um, and Thank well, you. should we try the rosé? Yes. Mm. Oh, what a wonderful colour. <laughs> Again, I feel like I'm being sort of transported six months into the future, into, in, in, into the summer, into a gloriously sunny English day. And I think that's probably what it's going to feel like when I start <laughs> buying it too. I hope so. Yeah? There we are. Um, so, <clears throat> our rosé. Mm. Again, a blend of Chardonnay and yep. Pinot Noir and Pinot Meunier. So all three of our varietals that we have planted on the estate. Um, so the same grapes that go into here, yes. correct? So how come it's rosé? How come it's got this pink colour? So, well, within our vineyard, we have lots of different uh, blocks of land, okay. if you like. Um, and these are all planted separately to different grape varieties, different clones of those varieties as mm. well. And that allows us to pick uh, up to, gosh, 200 different, um, uh, well, pick lots of different blocks, vinify them separately, um, and, and end up with 200 or so different base wines that we then use to blend. So when we press grapes for um, the Brut Reserve, for example, we press them very quickly and very gently, which means that for the Pinot Noir and Pinot Meunier, which of course are, are red varietals, there's no, um, there's, there's no way for the, the skin to come into contact with the juice so it, it comes out white rather than pink. Or than red. Uh, for rosé, we uh, will press some of that fruit uh, as a, a white base wine. We'll press some of it as a rosé base wine, so the juice will come out pink with a little bit of um, uh, contact with the skins. But we'll also add um, generally about four or five percent of still Pinot Noir, which has been barrel aged as well. That adds a colour but it also adds a little bit more weight and a bit more texture, I think, to the wine as well, which means that this rosé is, you know, as you say, it's a perfect summer wine. It's a wonderful barbecue wine. It's ridiculously dangerous. <laughs> I know this from my own barbecues. Um, but at the same time, because there's a little bit more weight to it, it actually works really, really well as a food pairing as well. Well, it smells lovely, and I'm going to... Mm. Mm. Oh, it's a taste of summer. It's delicious. And yep. red fruits. Yes. Yeah, red fruits. Exactly. Oh, yep. It's delicious. And this um, is going to go beautifully with Anna's macaron. So beautifully. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, perfect match, I hope. So the advice for everyone at home, pop the brute now and start enjoying. Mm, yes. And perhaps save the rosé for dessert. Yep. Good Sounds plan. good. Well, thank you very much indeed, Laura, for coming. Thank it's been you. A pleasure to see you again. And, and thank you. you for sharing your wealth of knowledge about Gasborn English sparkling wine. Brill. Well, I hope you enjoy the wines this evening as well. Cheers. Cheers.
Good evening and a warm welcome to a cooked tour. Good evening and welcome to a cook's tour and to our next destination, a food lover's night in Paris. My name is Charlie Grant Peterkin and I'm delighted to be joined this evening by the wonderful and supremely talented Anna Hoare. <laughs> Born in Dublin, Anna started her career working under prestigious chefs such as Shane Osborne at Pierre de Terre before moving on to open Gordon Ramsay's London House. In 2019, she launched her own debut restaurant, Myrtle, in Chelsea, which serves an Irish-inspired menu, winning awards for its elegant style of cooking. Anna was one of the professional chefs on BBC's Ready Steady Cook, in addition to being a presenter chef on Saturday Kitchen and a guest judge on MasterChef. Anna has also won Food & Wine's award for Best International Chef, and to top her credentials, Anna joins us here on a cook's tour for the most prestigious destination of them all, the capital of the culinary world, Paris. <laughs> There's an intro. Whew. Whoa, whoa. Whew. Take a breath now. To be honest, we? I'm sorry you've stopped. I want you to keep oh, going. I tell you, we could keep on going with your resume. But <laughs> Anna, seriously, here we are, Paris. Is it really the capital of the culinary world? Well, I think it is for me, at least. Um, when I was a young chef and I was first training, I didn't know that Paris was such a wonderful place to go to eat and to, to learn to cook. And it was my head chef that pulled me aside and said, if, if there's one place that you need to go and work in, it's Paris. So what does Paris mean to you? Paris means poverty and hunger. <laughs> <laughs> I, I was, suppose at that stage in your career. Yeah, I was very young and I was very poor and very inexperienced and I went there to grow and to learn. And I did. I learned a lot about cooking at home and I learned a lot about cooking in the kitchen. So it means a lot. Brilliant. And I suppose the interesting thing about Paris is so often on a cook's tour, we talk about these destinations we go to and how there's so much influence that comes to those destinations and to those cities or to those regions. But Paris, they created it all themselves. Mm -hmm. And that's pretty special. Yes. And it's also the city associated with love and oh. romance. And... and that's why we're here tonight. Yeah. To cook up a storm. That's it. Okay, well, um, everyone at home, uh, welcome to those who are new joining a Cook's Tour tonight. And for those who have joined us before, welcome back. Um, I'm just going to run through a little bit of housekeeping before we get cooking with Anna. The first thing to do is to set those ovens of yours to 180, 180, 190. We'll come on to that in a second. Um, and as ever, you are welcome to cook along with us now, or you can sit back, relax, enjoy your Gazbourne, and cook along later. The choice is yours. And hello to anyone who's cooking on Friday night. Great to have you guys on board. We have the live chat and Michael is on the end of that so any questions you have please pose those to Michael and he will get back to you um, and of course there is also the booklet so um, do refer to the instruction booklet if you need to. We will go at a good pace mm. because you're all very accomplished chefs at home we hope um, but if you do need to pause then just hit the space button um, and that will give you a moment or two to catch your breath and catch up with us. Um, as ever, we just love seeing photographs of your creations. So bring out the food stylist in you, get snapping, and let's see those photographs. And please do post using the hashtag cookwithrocket and tag a cook's tour and also tag um, Hauser as well. So, um, and uh, the best photographs, the most innovative, beautiful plating up, um, judged by Anna, will get a free box, a complimentary box, yes, on us to our next destination in a couple of weeks' time, 24th, 25th of Feb, which is going to be um, a mid-winter break to the sun of Mystique with Tristan Welch. Great. 
So that's all from me, Anna. Over to you. Um, what is on this evening's menu? Right. Well, today, Charlie, I'm going to do um, a beautiful potato velouté with mm. a truffle cream. That's what we're going to um, have as our amuse-bouche. Oh. Then it's going to be followed with an assiette of uh, salmon. Then we're going to do bœuf en croûte. Oh. And finished with a macaroon with a delicious kind of lemon, lemonade mousse. Delicious. And then for our guests at home who are cooking the vegetarian menu, we have a little butternut squash starter. Oh, we haven't forgotten about them. They're no. still spoiled. Yeah, so we have an assiette of butternut squash. So there's a few different versions of butternut squash on that plate, followed with a beetroot en croute, which is delicious. And the same dessert, the macaroon Lovely. with the lemonade mousse. Good. OK, well, let's make a start. And I think we're going to start by wrapping some beef and pastry. Yes. OK. Cool. Over to you. So um, you will ha you'll find in your little hamper some pancake, a little bit of extra pastry there as well, that's our pastry, it's nice and open. So this is a, this is a roll of pastry. <laughs> yes, yeah. a roll, roll of, pastry. of pastry. So it's a little bit more pastry um, than you need, um, yeah. but that's no harm. Uh, the beef is coming in sometimes slightly thicker and slightly thinner portions, so you okay. might need a little bit more for some of them. I see. So that's your pastry. I'm going to leave that over there for a second, over here for a second. Okay. And unwrap our pancake. What's in that little pouch? This oh, is your pancake. Your pancake. So this is really important when you make um, anything on croute. You want something that's going to catch the juices yeah. so that your pastry stays crispy. And that's why okay. this is very important. Because the biggest faux pas, isn't it, with buff on croute, is the dreaded soggy bottom. Soggy no one bottom. likes a soggy bottom, Nobody do they? Nobody likes a soggy bottom. No. So you're going to need your um, um, mushroom duxelle, chicken mousse, and pearl barley mix. Okay. You're going to need your piece of beef, your pancake, your mustard and your egg wash. Okay, so everyone at home, um, Anna has her pancake and you've, you've actually kept um, the piece of, um, what is that, sort of paper underneath it? Yes, on purpose. Okay, so well keep the paper spotted. underneath. Open up your pancake, pop it on top. Doesn't matter if it's got a few sort of tears or holes. I mean, they're all beautiful pancakes. No, it's very cooked. forgiving. It's very forgiving. It's very forgiving. But there shouldn't be a, a dramatic huge hole in the centre of it. It should be, it okay. should be fine. I hope not. Okay, so first thing we're going to do is season our beef. Okay, and this is the same process, of course. If you are doing the beef or the beetroot, pancake out. And are you going to season the beetroot as well? Yes, yep. season the beetroot and um, and then put some mustard on it as well. Okay. Now, I'm preparing this uh, Wellington to be uh, rare, medium rare. Okay. If somebody wants it to be um, a little bit more cooked, medium or medium well, I would say caramelise that off in a pan. For, for you know one or two minutes either side and that will start the cooking process which will mean by the time you've cooked it in the oven it will be medium or medium well if okay. that's what you're looking for. Top tip so yeah. flash that in the pan if you prefer your meat more cooked and I notice interestingly too that you this is all fillet but yes. some are in sort of slightly different shapes and sizes. Hawkeye Charlie huh? I nothing know. gets I past don't, you. I don't miss a thing. Yes so Obviously, the fillet that comes from the animal has a different size all the way through. And what, what we have done is that all the meat is the same weight, but they are different shapes. So with some people, they are going to have a longer Wellington, which will give you more slices. And some people will have a higher Wellington, which will just give you thicker slices. I see. OK. But it's the same, same meat, same animal. Yeah, that's it. And the same cooking time. And the same cooking time. Which Great. is very important. So the mustard goes on there, English mustard, which is a, a delicious um, secret weapon to have when you're doing a, a homemade and beef plenty wellington. Of it. Plenty of it. I'm not worried about things getting sort of too spicy. No, no. When you cook mustard, it mellows the flavour of mustard, so that's not a problem. Oh, okay, fine. So it definitely will not be too spicy. So next, you want to take your mousse, and you're you're right. focused on the core centre part of your pancake that you're spreading all of this down. Now this works as a barrier to stop your um, pastry getting um, soggy, but also this is so delicious and it's got like loads of texture. It's really yummy. Like this will make the most memorable beef wellington you'll ever have. So it's really good. Great. And are you literally going to sort of paste on the entire pot? Yes. No. Uh, yes. Use your entire pot. I would definitely recommend that. Okay. Now. 
Now, the origins of beef wellington, as I was reading up about, because, um, well, I should say the origins of boeuf en croute. Yes. Um, because actually, boeuf en croute is a dish that the French, of course, created and mastered. And it was the first Duke of Wellington, Arthur Wellesley, who actually um, had beef wellington named after him around the turn of the 19th century, although they think it might have been around Waterloo at the same time. So this is a French dish which the English came along and put their stamp on. Although, to be fair, we have in this country been wrapping meat in pastry for a very long time. You think of the Cornish and their Cornish pasties. Oh, yes. Yeah. I mean, that's sort of 14th century time. So. I love it. It's like history corner here. I'm a big fan of understanding why we do things and where things come from. Yeah. Carry you around in my back pocket, Charlie. OK, next. So we're moving okay. on to um, wrapping our our um, our kind of beef in the pancake in our pastry. So you'll notice that the paper that the crepe came on, I kept it in there and I just rolled mm. the uh, beef in the centre of it, keeping it as nice as tight as possible. If it's a little bit loose, it's not the end of the world. You'll have a little air pocket when it, when it cooks. It's, it's not um, uh, the be all and end all if, if, if you make a little mistake there. So now I'm gonna put some egg wash. Uh, approximately about, I'd say we're gonna use about half of this sheet of pastry. Mm -hmm. Um, a little bit extra is fine um, for a bit of overflow if you need it. Okay. And brushing quite generously. Yeah. And this just helps to connect the pancake to the pastry. So I'm going to pop that there. And then we're just going to roll, roll, roll. And then what you want to do is make sure that there's enough of an overflap so that um, the pastry doesn't separate yeah. and ping up like an elastic band. And then you just take a knife and cut it down. And the same uh, paper that the, the pastry comes on, you're going to keep your wellington on that and that's what's actually going to help it not stick to the oven tray in the oven, which is a really important oh, yes. tip tip from the top, you must have the heaviest based uh, uh, oven tray you have preheated in the oven and that's what's going to give your um, buff on croute a lovely crispy bottom. It's really important. And we also mentioned um, when we were going through the housekeeping a little bit about oven temperatures too. Mm, mm. And we sort of said 180, possibly 190. Yeah, so you should know your oven. You know, if you've got an oven that runs a bit hot, yeah. well then 180. If it runs a little bit cold, um, I'd go 190. 90. If you don't know, stick with 180 and I'm sure it'll be fine. Okay. So you're just yeah. trimming down. Just trimming that off yeah. so that you don't, so you can fit it in the oven basically. Yeah. And then we're gonna go with our first egg wash. Again, be quite generous. And did you sort of pinch the ends together? I pinched the ends just yeah. to um, hold in the heat of the of the um, the beef when it starts to cook. Yeah. You don't want any holes. So I'm quite liberal with that. So covering as much of the pastry as possible. And and what does this does it act as a sort of a glue to hold it together? Was it to do the, the the sheen? Help Makes me out. Makes it look sure. pretty. Makes it look pretty. Okay. Yeah, it's a bit, of, it's like, it's just finishing, it's a bit of detail. Oh, but this is going to make it look prettier. Yes. Well, it is Valentine's Day, so some little love hearts on here won't go amiss. Oh, look at them. There we go. And... What a cutie. Another, another glaze of these. Now, there's enough egg wash that when you pop this into the fridge, when you take it back out again, you could glaze it again, and that will make it even more gorgeous. To double, to, to double, to double or triple um, glaze your your pastry will make the color even more dramatic. Okay. Okay. So we'd advise people to pop this into the fridge now. And what will that do in the fridge? Is it? We'll set up the pastry so that when it goes into the hot oven, it'll have um, a better reaction with the butter grabbing hold of the flour inside the pastry. So it'll, it'll give you a better result. Is that when you're always working with pastry? Do you always want to go from sort of cold to hot? Yes. Out? Yeah, because I find that especially people who aren't chefs, their hands tend to get quite warm yeah. and very melty on the pastry. So I'm like, you need to get that into the fridge. Mm. Not everybody's got um, no blood in their hands like me, my freezing cold hands. What do they say? Warm hands? Warm cold heart? heart? No, yeah. Oh, do they? Cold heart. I know. Come on. <laughs> That's not what they say. Come on. <laughs> right. Can I help you clear down? Yes. Okay. So, so that is going into the fridge at home. So everyone at home, pop your 
buff en croute into the fridge. Yes. But Anna is going to sneak this one into the oven because, of course, we want it to be ready to show you um, towards the end of the cook along. But you guys at home, we recommend you put it into the fridge um, and then before you actually start eating your velouté, your lovely assietto salmon or butternut squash, that's when you want to put your beef wellington buff en croute into the oven. We're going to be mucking that up all the way through, aren't we? Beef wellington, beef crude, beef Yeah, crude. I, this is what I thought we'd yeah. do. We'll just call it the beef. Macaroon, macaron. We'll just call it the beef. Well, let's, just call, let's just call it the beef. Call it the beef. Right. So, shall we uh, move on to our, our plating our starters? Yes. What do you think? I think that's a great okay. plan. Right. And um, you're going to start with the butternut squash. Butternut squash. Can you pass me a plate there, please? I certainly can. Okay. So, vegetarians, don't think we... I don't think you're neglected. This yeah. is definitely, I, I think, a beautiful, delicious dish. So we have some butternut squash pickled. Also, if you pescatarians at home, all those meat eaters, um, watch and learn. Because in a second or two, Anna's going to be plating up um, the assiette of salmon. And I tell you, today's cook-along is all about, well, it's a lot about, it's about a lot of things, but it is particularly about the elegance and the art of plating. And, um, She's the master. <laughs> so yeah, I, I feel that people get quite nervous when they're plating and sometimes they try to rush their way through it because they just want it done. Mm. With a dish like this, particularly because it's cold, you can take your time, there is no hurry. And um, the if you do make a mistake, you also can just like stop and you can start again. As in, it's a cold starter, it will be forgiving. And I think it's really important to kind of give yourself a little bit of time. Okay. Um, a little bit goes a long way. So uh, when I dress um, dishes, there's two styles I do. I do a clean style where it's very empty plate and there might be one or two things on the plate. And another thing I do, which is like a kind of dancing uh, dressing, and that's where I will always use odd numbers. So with this, we're going to start with uh, one piece of butternut squash so here. So are we dancing? We're dancing. Oh, we're dancing, we're dancing. Let's dance. Okay, let's get a groove on. So um, I like to keep things kind of off center and slightly moved to left and right so that it all looks, the imperfection makes it look perfect. So basically you can't make any mistakes when you're doing <laughs> okay. this. So I started with one uh, piece this way, another piece the opposite way. And then I've mirrored that same one here. Mm. You don't have to do this, but if you do it, it is a bit of a formula and a system. And lots of chefs dress this way. So we make it look like everything is an accident, but it really is an accident on purpose. So I'm going to start with some puree here. Mm -hmm. So as I pipe it, I'm pushing it onto the butternut squash. And you can see I've followed a kind of form of that side, then that side, then mirrored that one again. Yeah. And then I'm going to take my pickles and I'm just going to curve them slightly mm. and because they're sitting on top of this delicious roasted uh, butternut squash puree that holds it in place so you've got a bit of pickle you've got a bit of roast you've got a bit of cream in there and, sort of it's, and i guess baked. it's also about sort of varying textures isn't it that's it charlie yeah you've got it there that's exactly what it's about really celebrating a beautiful ingredient with all of the, the different versions that you can do of it. And it's amazing too, I know it's, it's quite chefy, the piping bag, but it gives you a, an enormous amount of sort of control. Absolutely. Um, if you're using a spoon, it's definitely possible, but by, by using the piping bag, it is about control. And they're small piping bags, so as I'm squeezing, it's a real gentle squeeze it's not like a, a shotgun it's okay. just like a real gentle squeeze because sometimes people panic and I, I, you know you just need to take a deep breath have a nice little sip of wine take your time Ooh, yes. dress it okay so now we're going to go with our pumpkin seeds yeah and when you're sort of creating dishes uh, myrtle do you do you how, how i mean when do the dishes come to you? Do they come to you at sort of three o'clock in the morning? Do they come to you when you're at the playground with yeah. Oshin? Do they come to you? And then, then what do you do? Do you write them down? Do you draw a picture? Do you get into the kitchen and start trying things? So I feel you force the things upon your partner. <laughs> I feel the you dishes. You feel the dishes. Okay. Um, I I um I would definitely say I'm quite lucky in a way that um, I love my job so much and I take great pleasure in creating dishes. 
So it's not a stressful thing for me to, yeah, to sure. do to, to do creating. But I could be at the art gallery. I could be at a music concert. Yeah. I could be walking home from work, sitting on the bus, and an idea will pop into my mind. And it's like I can sense it before I can see it, um, which sounds a bit um, dramatic. Uh, yes, sounds and then good. my partner, I do force the, the, the dishes upon him. And sometimes he's a little bit unsure, particularly because the dishes uh, are Irish inspired, so he might not necessarily be familiar with them, but he's always delighted. I'm sure he's always very willing. Okay, so um, seeds on, then you put on the little sort of cresses. Yeah. What, what, what cress was that? So basil cress, basil cress which okay. goes so, people associate basil and tomato. Oh my goodness. There's so many vegetables that basil goes with and yeah. butternut squash is one of those vegetables. And then little flowers, little um, violas, I want to say? No, uh, no they're oh, corn flowers. Corn flowers, okay. Yeah, they're corn flowers. And then a little bit of filo de brick to give it a texture. So as you kind of crunch your way through the beautiful goat's curd and the caramelized roasted butternut squash, you've got that lovely crunchy uh, filo de brick to go with that as well. Delicious. Great. Right, take that away. That's early. right. I'll take that Let's away. Move on to the salmon. Let's move on to the salmon. Okay. We'll come back to that. Yes. Oh, and I'll pass you a plate for the salmon. So one of the first things to do when you get your salmon is you need to, because you have two portions here, you're just going to cut your slices. You've got three slices and you're just going to cut each slice in half. And then that way you've got your two portions portioned. Okay. So um, putting the menu together tonight, what was your sort of, what was your inspiration? What were your thoughts behind it? So. When I lived in Paris, mm. and it was, I mean, nearly 20 years ago now, um, I dreamed of this food. I would pass by the, the brasseries that would be advertising what they were selling inside, and I would dream of anything en croute to me sounded like the most luxurious mm. and the most fabulous uh, dish you can imagine. When you think of smoked salmon, like we in Ireland, obviously, it's a huge dish. But in France, they've got a, a massive respect for, for good quality smoked fish. So for me, it is just such a, a luxurious version of, of what food you can find when you're when you're eating in a brasserie or in a bistro in, in Paris. Mm. Gosh, you talk about brasseries and bistros in Paris and you know, just sort of you know think of that sort of cafe um, culture that lifestyle which you know exists in Paris and, and, and through France it's just the most wonderful city isn't it in terms of sort of um, well all of that the culture the arts the galleries the, the food the, the drink I mean it's got it all going on it has it all and when I lived in Paris very often I couldn't afford to eat out but I would buy you know beautiful smoked salmon and yeah. have it with a baguette sitting in, in in the park with a bottle of wine I was gonna I'm not say, sure if this all suddenly I went down you <laughs> sitting on the steps of the Sacré Coeur with your bottle of you know, 10 franc wine <laughs> Um, and guzzling away oh, your baguette and burrito. But honestly, I was I was a little street urchin back then. <laughs> I was really uh, burnt and bruised from 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 the job, but uh, so delighted all the same. I, I I it never lost its magic. It never disappointed me. I lived in commerce when I was there. And it was a joy every day, every night when I would walk home exhausted from work. I would breathe in the stinky Paris air and I would just think to myself, I cannot believe this is my life. I cannot believe I, I work here. It was really special. OK, now what's going on here? So I've started off with my salmon riette, mm -hmm. which is um, in replace of what the kind of uh, slow um, uh, roasted chunks were. Yep. And on top, I'm going to start with uh, little kind of curls of our smoked salmon. Okay. So one one side and then another the other. So this is like a, a double whammy of deliciousness. And then I have some gorgeous pickled fennel, which is sweet with a little bit of acidity, which is just going to kiss the sides of that smoked mm. fish and really bring out the flavor. Can I try some? You can. Can I, can I get my little fingers into there? Go for it. Go. Oh. Mm. And then we have some beautiful, also another pickled veg, another pickled cucumber. So as, as I've Ooh, grown as a chef, one thing I've definitely learned is the importance of acidity in a dish. Okay. It's what kind of awakens the other flavors, particularly if you've got smoked fish, it is born to be with a little bit of acidity, but the sweetness that we've got in this pickle really makes it sing. Now let me see, what else have I got going on here? 
Well, it's all a balancing act, isn't it? I guess the the the, the sweet against the the the, the saltiness and the, the soused-ness. Exactly. Is that, is that such a thing? That is definitely that's a thing. Definitely a thing that's isn't that's it? definitely a word, Charlie. Yeah. Um, and then as as I'm plating things, you'll see that you're leaning um, your ingredients against each other and roughly moving in threes approximately. And an odd number, for whatever reason, seems to aesthetically look more pleasing. Mm. They say that nature works in odd numbers and that's why it's so beautiful, but I'm not sure if that's true. Well, you do eat with your eyes. I mean, we've said it before. Yes, well. And I think, I mean, these are all superb ingredients. Um, and, you know, we're very lucky that on a cook's tour we send you some fantastic ingredients from brilliant suppliers and um, the team back at Rocket sort of create all these wonderful rubs and stocks and so forth. But I know also tonight you wanted to create menus that actually you could then go out and do again at home. So you can do that for your dinner party and you can find most of these things and they're simple processes absolutely in a supermarket can't you absolutely you definitely can um the the, the riette you could make yourself which is super easy it could just be uh, some the difference between this is that you have a hot smoked salmon and you have a cold smoked salmon mm. so the riette is made with a hot smoked salmon today and you just mix it with some cream cheese maybe a bit of lemon zest and you'll have the same mix that we have here today buy some smoked salmon some uh, cucumber with a little bit of dash of vinegar and sugar and you you can just recreate this dish and, just like that and it's just before so you easy. know it you'll be out of the job Anna. <laughs> I don't think I'll ever be out of a job. <laughs> now, our little little piece de resistance at the end of this is um, some pink peppercorns. Okay, so what's I'm, that going to add apart from a beautiful hint of colour? It, yeah, it has this, here, smell. It's got a beautiful floral mm. um, note to it and a little bit of spiciness from the peppercorn. And as you can see, I was quite controlled in how I added it. I didn't go crazy and sprinkle it all around. But if that's what you like, there's no harm in that. <laughs> you can't do, nothing is wrong. When you're plating your own dishes, you are essentially creating your own style. So there is There we go. Salmon. Fabulous, fabulous. Let's put that to one side. We shall return to that later. Um, so, the boeuf en croute is, ours is in the oven, but yours should be firmly in the fridge at home. Um, so we're going to have a little bit of a tidy up here, and then we're going to move on to the macaron. Macaron yeah. or macaroon? macaroon? Well, there is a difference, isn't there? There is. Now, who is correct? Is well, the who is correct? Well, <laughs> uh, the first thing to say is actually, I think it originates the macaroon from Italy. Uh, well, I mean, you know, did I did not know this. Well, I well actually, so. it makes sense because the Italians were famous for pastry originally. Please go on. Well, please go on. And like Picasso once said, all art is theft. So I'm no surprise that, you know, the French came in there and just took the macaroon and made it their own. But the macaron is with ground blanched almonds. Mm -hmm. OK, and the macaroon should be made with sweetened flaked coconut. So I think technically you are correct. I used to buy macaroons all the time yeah. as a little girl. I used to be able to buy them as a, a treat in the shop. Um, but don't we call macarons macaroons? <laughs> don't we? Don't we call them that? I think we do. I think we do. I think we do. Think anyway, we do. so onto the macaroon. So onto the macaroon. Uh, plate. 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 Now, would you like to do one as well? I thought you'd never ask. Yeah. Yes, please. Okay. Right, so first thing you're going to do when you're plating up your macaroon is uh, place the coolie on the plate. Okay. This um, is a lovely blueberry coolie. Ooh. So super simple. You just mm -hmm. take half of whatever is in the pot and you're just going to place it slightly left off center um, on the plate. Okay. And then you're going to take the, the bottom half of your macaroon. Okay. I'm paying special attention to this. Well, well, no, I but, will um, be judging you. Will you. Be judging you. Okay. Okay. So, so you just nip the top of your um, piping bag off, yeah. and you're going to do uh, roughly about eight. So twelve o'clock, six o'clock, nine o'clock, three o'clock, and then fill the gaps. That's it. Genius. Oh, bless you. <laughs> and then in the center. Okay, and then you place the gold side to the right hand side of your plate. And then I'm just piping a small amount on the plate and that's what's going to hold our blueberries and our flour on. Mm -hmm. Okay, so got some blueberries here, which I'm, I'm going to cut in mm -hmm. half. Move that out of the way for you. Oh, 
Timer's ready. <laughs> what is that? <laughs> <laughs> that timer is to tell you that we have 14 minutes left before the Wellington comes out of the oven and it's time to get our veg in. That's what that's telling me. So I'm going to cut these real quick and then I'm going to pop my veg in. Okay. So you can place your blueberries a little bit ad hoc around there. Four or five halves a portion should be enough. Mm -hmm. And your little flourish at the end is a viola flower. Just tucked Beautiful. in on the side. Now, Charlie. So I'm going to have a go, but should we get the veg in first? Yes, so we're going to put our velouté in at the same time, our mash, and can you reach that because my little T-Rex arms doesn't, don't fit. Okay, so we're going to place them into, make sure your pot is big enough um, to fit all of your, your veg in there. And there should be a jus as well, please. Yes, there is. So yeah, if you give these about 10, 15 minutes to heat up, that should be plenty of time to get so them lovely and hot. So guests at home can do this now, or should they do it a little bit later? Um, they want to do it 15 minutes before they're ready to have their main course, okay. and that should fine. be fine. So I'll just set another little timer to add a bit of music to yeah, our Yeah, why not? That caught me off guard. <laughs> so you've got the, 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 the jus, the mash, the vegetables, and the velouté, the so velouté. four pouches all in some um, water. That yeah. is sort of and that's on up. a kind of medium heat, so it's like a small, very gentle simmer is the perfect temperature for that. But also you could use the microwave, you could pop them, make sure you open them before you put them in the microwave, yeah. and um, three, four minutes and that will do the same job as well. Perfect. Great, is it over to me? Come on Charlie, Okay, me. fine, here we go. So everyone at home, back to your macaroon, so okay. So when you're dressing a dish, you are dressing for the guest or for yourself. Uh -huh. okay. So as the dish is facing you, that is how it will look when you sit down, as opposed to the opposite side there. Does that make sense, It Charlie? does make perfect sense. Okay, so there's that. And then I noticed you did a little bit of sort of... Just a little, a little zhuzhing around. You managed to create a perfect circle. Uh, Not bad, Charlie. Yeah? Yes. C'est bon. C'est bon. Great, I'm gonna go rid of that. Macaroon. Now remember which side goes on the plate. So there's the lovely um, gold. So that's not going to go the on the top. Plate. Exactly. That's go there like that. I'm going to pop this sort of like this. Yeah. Sort of like that. <laughs> Very good. Okay, this is the bit I've been looking forward to. Yes. Get some squirting going. Okay. So upright. Yeah. Okay. Like that. Yeah. So you've got control, you're piping, squeezing gently and moving up. Okay, here we go. Ah. Oh. Yeah? Perfecto. Merci bien. Ah, you're a great student. Thank you, chef. There we go. I'm amazed that you can do this and talk at the same time. <laughs> a lot of concentration going on here. Go. Very good. And a little bit in the center. Yep. You're a natural. Comme ça? Yeah. Perfect. A little bit more is going to oh, go oh on yes, the plate, oh yes, remember? Oh just, oh yes, oh and yes. then that's just going to hold your berries in plate, place. Now, if you don't put that on, it's not the end of the world. But what might happen is when you pick up your plate, the berries might just roll around a little bit. Yeah. So it's, it's all about control, you know. Hat yes. on first. Yes, turn it around the other way so you see the gold yeah. and the gold to the right. Perfect. Gorgeous. Et voilà. Et voila. And then these, I'm just going to dance mm -hmm. in here like this. Some facing up, some facing down. A bit of artistic license there. Yeah. Slide him in there. Just going to casually. <laughs> gonna casually. <laughs> and I think Beautiful. That's it. I don't yeah. that one. No, no, I think that's And enough. then one that's more enough. thing's Aha. missing. The flare. And aha, aha. Aha, there we go. And that's just going to nestle delicately. In the ah, très bien. Et voilà. Merci. Ah. There we go. That is quite beautiful. Honestly, you couldn't tell uh, who, who dressed which. You kind of could. <laughs> no, no, no. Great, okay. Okay, so. so let me briefly talk to you now about when you are ready to serve your um, amuse-bouche, mm -hmm. which is the potato velouté. You want to get your little demi-tasse cups ready on the side, because once you sit down to have that, the whole show is about to begin. Great. So once that's ready to go, um, that's when they're going to put the Wellington in the oven. 
perfect. Well, what we should do now is just clear down our surfaces mm -hmm. here. Let's get all our delicious plates out. Um, and then we should be ready for the vegetables. Yeah. To do the velouté. And then hopefully the beef wellington will be ready to go. Okay. So, I'm going to move that too. Those front and centre. Chopping board out of the way. Anna, what was it like, go on, tell us quickly, working mm. for Gordon Ramsay? Because that is something that sort of does sing on your CV. You know, I get asked this question a lot, um, Charlie, but the truth is um, all of the people I, I have chosen to work for over the years all had similar characteristics as uh, Gordon Ramsay. Yeah. They were all very inspiring, very passionate, um, and very good at what they did. So uh, when you work for somebody who is challenging and talented, it, it makes you better and it makes you stronger. So I absolutely loved working for Gordon, as I have pretty much for every every one of my bosses, I think, have, have challenged me and, and made me stronger because of their strengths. So yeah, I, I really liked working for him. I think he was very fair and I think, um, you know, once you were able to communicate with him and, and say, you know, what was going on, he had no problem. Mm. Yeah, I never had any problems working Good. with Gordon. You never got too angry? No, never, no, never angry with me, no. Because I, I was trained by then as well. So yes. I understood when he would ask me for something, I knew what it was. And if I didn't, I would ask more questions. I, I'm not a yes, 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 and go worry later on. I'm figure it out then and go ahead and do it properly. You got angry with him instead? <laughs> no, never. nobody gets angry with Gordon, <laughs> except for maybe Tana, his wife. I'd imagine she, <laughs> she's allowed. Right. Right, so these are our little demi tasses. So before you put your velouté into the cups, yep. uh, that is when you're going to put your buff en croute into the oven. Okay. Once you're right. ready to start your meal, that is when you start cooking the main course. You've got 35 minutes then to enjoy your delicious amuse-bouche and then your delicious starter, a glass of wine, and then just about then as you clear the plates, your timer should go off for your beef and you're ready to carve. Take your vegetables out of there, hot water, and eat. Okay. Sounds perfect. Okay. So I need to get a chopping board up here first. Yeah, perfect. So if I can do that, please. There we go. Okay. Place that here. So for everyone at home, what we're going to do now is we're going to, Anna's going to plate up the, the, the velouté, we're going to plate up the vegetables to show you how it can be done when you're ready to do it at home. Yep. And then, fingers crossed, the beef on croute, croute will be ready and we can whip that out of the oven, carve it, and voila. We shall be there. So this is such a brilliant pouch. It's really useful. I would recommend if you had a scissors just to snip the side off. I don't have a scissors, so I'm going to use a knife. I do not recommend using a knife. It's dangerous. Please use a scissors. Um, okay. So I'm going to pour that into our lovely demi tasse. What makes this so great is that this isn't hot, this isn't hot, but your velouté in the centre uh, is lovely and hot. Good, good. So, oh, silly me. I forgot to add our lovely... Ah. Our truffle, our truffle cream. So this is cream, okay. what elevates what is quite a delicious but simple velouté into Premier League, absolutely luxurious and specially delicious. And that is that is just what butter, cream, truffle, truffle, and a little bit of cream and a little bit of cream cheese as well. I can't see what I'm doing. Please actually pour uh, into the cup. Where is it? There we go. You got it. I was very worried there for a second. <laughs> and this okay. is a potato and truffle velouté. Exactly. And again, um, lots of cream and butter, I guess. Yes. Delicious. All the good things. No. And if you can pour, uh, pass me the bowls for the vegetables, I can finish yep. that. Of course. Mm. So inside this, we have our beautiful heritage carrots yeah. and our sprouting broccoli. And I've got a lovely little tub here now of mushroom duxelle, a nice, delicious a little bit of truffle in there as well. Don't spare the truffle. And what it does is that you take what is seen as quite um, everyday vegetables and you elevate them into being elegant and unforgettable. Oh, great. Okay. Houses. And, and then we're um, going to take our mash. some mashed potato, yes. 
difference? Is there a difference between mashed potato, pom puree, and all these other words? You know, it's, it's, it's a really good uh, question because when it comes to mashed potato, I think you think about it being kind of crushed and it may have some milk in there and it may have um, some butter. But when it comes to um, pom puree, you're thinking that it's very luxurious. Okay. You have some cream in there and butter to make it extra special. So you've got some nice pom puree. Okay. And very gracefully presented out of a pouch. <laughs> but you could, you could never Pinel, tell. You could Roche, you could yes, but you, could, you, you would never know that that came from a pouch. <laughs> okay, and then we're just going to add our, do we have a jug there? I do, we do have a little jug there. Okay. And I'm just gonna pour this in there now. Hopefully this isn't going to spill everywhere. Woo! Sometimes life doesn't always go as you expected, but it did today. Good. Now, I believe it is time for me to take okay. the buff out of the oven. It's a big moment. It's a big moment. Okay. Oh, look at her. Now. Wow. Are you so happy, you Chef? See, yes, I'm very happy. You can see it's got a lovely glaze on it now, which comes from the, the double glaze. But if you did it one more time, it would be even deeper in colour, which is yeah. nice. And if we just give that jug a little clean. And I've got my two plates. You do have your two plates here. We've also got the, um, the beetroot en croute as well. Oh, that's correct. So uh, we do have the beetroot en croute, which I might just well. carve that one first. Yeah. So that I don't have any... have got so many... Late. So this is difficult to know what to do with everything up here. Anyway, juggle around the best of my ability. I keep trying to cut things with that fork. Okay, right. So let's have a look here. So is this the is this is this the beetroot? This is the, the beet. Buff? This is the beetroot. This is the beetroot. Oh wow! Look at that. So you certainly are not being shortchanged when it comes to your beetroot no. experience. Shall we put that on one of the plates? Yeah. Wonderful. Okay, this is the big moment. This is the big the drum moment. roll is required. I'm not going to lie, Charlie, I'm a little bit nervous. So, quick top and tail. Oof. <laughs> Here we go. Okay. Oh, yes, chef. Yes. You've got to be pretty pleased with that. Take a bow. Wow. I'll take a little curtsy. <laughs> okay, right. So, hang on. Try to, I might actually just trim this. Just being a little bit of a perfectionist there. And why no resting? So, uh, yes, so this is a really important, um, the meat has quite slowly cooked through because of the layer of the mousse around yeah. the outside, so that it hasn't really aggressively been hit. If you rest the meat, it will obviously relax the meat, it will be much nicer, but I've created it so that the cuisson is perfect, so that you can just carve and eat, and it doesn't interrupt with the, your meal that you're enjoying. Okay, so it was about just kind of making it as convenient as possible, but still having a, a gorgeous, juicy, tender fillet as you can see. Wow, right there. that's quite serious. Yes, well, I'm a serious chef. I mean, serious business. Great. And then um, a little jus. A jus, uh, shall we pour? Well, why not? Okay. Gosh. So Anna, one last time, just tell us what we have here. Okay, so first of all, you're gonna start with your beautiful potato velouté with truffle cream cheese. Then you're gonna continue with either your salmon assiette mm. or your butternut squash assiette. Then with your star of the show, which is a gorgeous um, beetroot en croute or buff en croute with a complimentary truffle uh, heritage ve vegetables and a pom puree. Oh yes, and a dessert. <laughs> Yes, there's a dessert. I don't really have a sweet tooth. Uh, you have your macaroon macaron with your lovely uh, lemon mousse and a blueberry coulis and some fresh blueberries. On well, the Anna, well done. <laughs> well done. How incredible. I've, I don't think I've ever seen such beautiful, beautiful food um, in the Cook's Tour kitchen. So thank you so much for coming and joining and sharing all your wise words and all your wisdom 
that is um, stored upstairs in a whole <laughs> new brain of yours. Um, what a wonderful show. Thank you so much, Anna, for joining us. And thank you as well at home for joining us for a Cook's Tour. And um, so, yeah, don't forget, take photographs of your creations and get posting on um, our Instagram and tag Rocket um, at a Cook's Tour and also Hauser. And let's see those creations. And of course, um, the most beautiful dishes will be getting uh, a complimentary box to our next destination, which is really quickly worth mentioning with Tristan Welch, who spent three years living on the wonderful island of Mystique in the Caribbean. Can you imagine? Um, the, 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 the land of the rich and famous, but also the land of some incredible ingredients and wonderful cooking technique. And we're going to have five incredible dishes. Um, halibut cooked the mahi-mahi style, which is going to be fascinating. Of course, we can't go to the Caribbean without doing jerk, uh, jerk chicken. Um, and he's got a delicious full of booze, rum, baba to finish off with. Mm. So do come and join us on the 24th, 25th of February for that. Um, so that's it, folks. Thank you very, very much. Please do tell your friends and family all about us. And um, we hope to see you again soon. Bye bye. <laughs>